Part of it is is just, you know, coming in and feeling the vibe of the, the studio itself, right? You, you step into the, the studio, you kind of look around and you get this like really cool energy and you're like, yeah, I can see myself working here versus on, on Zoom, you just, you don't get that, right? It, it's, it's, well, at least it's very hard. <laughs> My guest today is the amazing Jimmy Ogg, who is currently the recruiting department supervisor at Animal Logic. For over six years, he supported his team there, recruited and trained future talent. Together, we talk about the recruitment experience, interviews, what makes a good candidate, and how we can cross the bridge from an application to getting hired for the job. You are listening to The 21 Artist Show, a podcast that inspires creatives to make meaningful content to pursue their passion. I'm talking with creators, artists, and engineers about their careers, lessons they have learned, and how to make an impact. I'm your host, Alexander Richter. I'm a technical director and coach in visual effects, animation, and games. For more content, go to 21artistshow.com. Enjoy the show. It's super amazing to have you on the show, Jimmy. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. First thing I have to ask is, what exactly does a recruiting department supervisor at Animal Logic do? I guess it's well. Well, definitely, I still recruit, uh, and and you know, I, I'm glad I do because uh, I'm very passionate about the recruiting aspect. But uh, the other part of it is is managing the team. So I have a recruiter, and I also have a recruiting coordinator. So I'm helping develop them. My, in fact, my recruiter started as a recruiting assistant and through mentoring and training, um, I was able to help uh, bring her up into a recruiter role. So, so there's a lot of that, that's uh, of the, the mentoring and training aspect that's involved. Um, and then the other part of it is really just uh, looking at the department as a whole and thinking about where efficiencies could be. So for example, uh, we implemented a, a new applicant tracking system uh, that was part of sort of this evaluation of our tools that we had. And, and so I did a lot of testing of different systems and um, talking to different uh, vendors. And we came up with Greenhouse, which is our, our current system, which we really like. And the supervisors seemed to, to like it too. That was an important aspect of, of the system. Um, and then I guess it's really just a relationship building with the, our different clients. So obviously production is one client and making sure that we're meeting their needs. Uh, and then R&D would be another client of ours. So internal clients essentially, and, and making sure that um, we're partnering together. Uh, and, and I'm not doing all of that. Um, you know, I'm getting my, my recruiters and the team to, to get involved in those things and giving them ownership and responsibility as well. Uh, but it, but that's essentially the the key aspects. Yeah, that's something I noticed. For example, when I was uh, working at Weta, that we called the people we are supporting stakeholders, mm. and you call call them clients. So for me, it was kind of a little bit weird because because I'm I'm not coming from this huge industries, from this huge companies. So it was always like the animator basically you know like like he came over and then or he wrote a ticket but it was still like the animator and when i heard like stakeholders it always feels like like a business and you have investing people <laughs> and they basically hold the key to the to the investment and so you have to provide the value so they keep investing kind of that's what it feels like so so when when you say like client always feels a little bit like basically detached in a way is. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that's that's the way it feels internally, but the, the mentality needs to be that, that we are a service department, right? We are providing a service to the different areas. Yes. So that's why I use the word client, but internally, no, it's a partnership ultimately. We, we don't see like a client vendor feeling. It's a, yeah, it's a partnership working together to solve hiring problems. Yeah, because that's also one of the things I always tell people if they want to become like technical directors is like we are, we are supporting. So we don't actually do, do any work on the film itself a lot of times. Mm. A lot of times we only help with scripts, with solving problems, with creating workflows. But we at the end of the day, we are basically serving the group that will actually do the movie, for example. And we are not the, the ones to, that deliver. 
you know yeah. so if if we wouldn't be there like if we would be the only people there would be a mo no movie basically <laughs> in, in the end so i can feel a little bit the the connection here to to a lot of departments like like yours for example totally before we dive into the like the main topic is did you always wanted to become like a recruiter in animation was that something you kind of grew up to want to be? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, I wanted to be an artist. And, and in fact, I went to school and went through the process of applying for, for jobs and, and landed my first job as an animator at uh, Mainframe. Now, Vancouver, uh, the Vancouver industry back then was really small. So there, there wasn't a lot of opportunities. Um, but uh, I got lucky and uh, started animating on a couple TV series shows. Um, and then experienced my, my first layoff, which was a bit scary for me. <laughs> uh, I then started teaching at an, an animation school um, to, to sort of bridge a gap before I, I'd, I wanted to pick up some, some new, new work. That was around 2000, 2001, 2002 kind of. Yeah, and, and I don't know, I, it just, it's something that really clicked to me is, is just um, working with the artists and and i really wanted to to make sure that the artists had the best experience possible and and i'll be honest the school that i was teaching at had some improvements that needed to be made and, and so i just <laughs> you know i took it upon myself to to really work with the the school owners and and you know we hired some you know really specialist teachers in in the various different areas i put on school events um i tightened up the curriculum and I just really fell in love with the, the business side of things. And I just decided at that point I was going to go back to school and get my business management degree. I, I really didn't know in the end where that would lead me. But um, while studying, I, I really liked the HR side of, of business management. And so when I, I graduated, I was like, okay, how can I take my experience as an animator and my my new experience in HR and combine them together in recruiter that's uh, that's what came up um, and yeah I landed uh, a job at uh, image engine um, they they were transitioning from being a TV studio moving into uh, VFX like feature feature VFX and with the District 9 being the, the first really big film with uh, Neil Ooh. Blomkamp. And they had no, no HR department. I was sort of the first person on the floor to, to really um, be HR, I guess you could say, as a recruiter. And it was just, you know, building the relationships with the managers and really hiring the team. And uh, it, was, it was a fantastic experience. And I stayed there for seven years. What is exactly the specific thing that you find most fascinating about that? Because you you started as an animator, that was kind of the passion. And I mean, that's the thing is like you just because you start something and you have this imagination of being a director or uh, something, you know, bom bombastic and you do the movie, you know, James Cameron style. And uh, at the end of the day, I think if you if you practice it and if you work in it, you actually see if it's something that is close to your heart as something that mm. you want to do like day by day, you know? And so what was it exactly that you felt is, was the pivot point that said like, you know, I don't want to be an artist. I want to be someone who supports the people. I guess it was, it's what's really just in the, the doing I, that, you know, when I was in the role and, you know, I'm, I'm, finding people and connecting them with opportunities and then watching them grow within those opportunities. There's, there's just, was just something so satisfying about that is being a part of somebody's journey. Why not producer? I like the interaction with, uh, with people. Yeah, I guess as a producer, you're, you're probably in that aspect too, where you got, well, you're, you know, you're dealing with spreadsheets and budgets. Um, I don't know. I maybe I would enjoy a producer role. I'm not, I'm not, I have not done it before. After this episode, yeah. <laughs> your, linking, your LinkedIn star status suddenly changes. <laughs> you know, for now, I I think there. You know, it's still something I'm very passionate about and and love talking about. In fact, I was just uh, I met up with a, a recruiter 
um, last night for coffee. She uh, she just mo recently moved to to Vancouver, and uh, we had connected at like um, a conference probably six seven years ago uh, when she was uh, living in China at the time, I think. Uh, anyways, uh, living in Vancouver now, we kept connected and we just uh, chatted for a couple hours just about recruitment processes. And it was just so fun. I, I just love talking about it. You described it basically, but that's what I, what I mean is like, um, it's the job only kind of uh, is is just a box of your interests. You know, it doesn't mean that there is not not like shifts. You know, just because you mm. like recruiting doesn't mean you could be you couldn't be like a producer, for example. Because a lot of things are overlapping. You know, for example, yeah. um, a lot of times, like I see the same management stuff in uh, leadership roles, supervising roles. Basically, it's it's so far away from the artistic or techno technology part where you basically are more a manager. So a lot of people who are maybe not the biggest interest after a while, especially are in the in the technical part or the artistic part, you know, after a while, maybe you get bored from that, are, are a lot of times enjoying this kind of supervising role because it is completely different. It, it needs completely different skills. And then you kind of, if you if that's something that you like, that's it's like, you know, there's like multiple ways to do that. There's different parts of a person's journey too, right? So somebody who's in a role and you know they're they're working and there's the training and development aspect of it challenges with the the artists that they have to work through and you know personal problems so, so there's as, that aspect of it too so you've got sort of artist management you got hr you got training and development i'm i'm at the beginning and, and i like being at the beginning where it's connecting people with opportunity uh, i think and and that's that's the the enjoyment i i find but I think also if you are at the beginning, it's also you have to have a good judgment of character. I think that is actually because that's the I think that's the the hardest part or one of the hardest parts of, of this specific job is to predict a future outcome of someone. Because at the end of the day, I mean, um, that's no one wants this investment into a person for months or even years and then to find out he was not delivering he's not balancing out the, the group or even toxic or other problems that uh, arises so basically um isn't that one of the skills that you have to kind of figure out is to judge someone just by very short yeah interviews it's crazy i mean some interviews are 30 minutes and and in 30 minutes you need to judge that person's character now you know i i think this industry is small, right? And people yes. know people. And, and so a lot, a lot of what, what's coming around is, is feedback from, from other people that, uh, hey, you know, I worked with this person, they're awesome, really love to have them on the team again. Uh, so that, that still happens, of course, your, your reputation travels with you. And uh, that's something I always tell the, uh, the students that I have is, is you know you, you really need to to think about your reputation, who you are. But you know I'm not doing it alone, right? So interviews involve me. There's there's a supervisor and sometimes a lead, and we're we're all collectively giving our feedback together. And and if there's an alignment there that we're all in agreement, then then you know it's a good sign. I always wonder because I also like teach people how to do interviews and that's something mm. where I'm always, um, I personally enjoy interviews. I love them. I don't know. I, it, it's for me, it became total fun to me. I mean, I think, I don't know, you probably had the situation too, is like interviews sucked, like in the beginning, as especially if you were the <laughs> recruiter, if you do interviews, you, you are very excited, overly excited. You think like you will fail, you're the worst. You start to stumble upon your words <laughs> and, you know, and, and in a way, in a way, if you do too many interviews unsuccessfully, you start to hate them. I mean, that's the, I think mm. that's a, a little bit of like this kind of failure uh, streak, but personally, I love interviews because I mean it's the same thing like this podcast I think maybe it, it is connected um, that that I love to talk to the people and I see myself in the same position as the opposite side so I try to get as much information from the other side as they try to get from me how much is it at the end of the day the like gut feeling if you want to recommend someone or not I don't think it ever should be a, a gut feeling I mean that that you know, I, I obviously should be based on on something, some sort of substance, right? 
Yes. Uh, it, but inevitably, it, it, it likely does happen. What we try to do is, I, I, or I encourage the, the supervisors to have a list of questions. And, and, and I, not, not in the sense it's a tick off box checklist, right? But, but in the sense that you're, at least you have questions and you have an ultimate goal or, or objective of your interview, right? And that objective is the same for everybody. So everybody gets treated fairly in their, their interviews. So normally I think, at least with artists, you're, you're already going in with a, a fairly good sense of a skill based off the demo reel, right? So a lot of the, what the interview is, is confirming that knowledge and, and getting a sense of the personality and, and their sort of work ethic, I guess you could say. But isn't that exactly, uh, because that's, that's one of the things I always uh, tell my, my students is, is like, the interview is not about your skill per se, is basically what you said. It is to make sure that what you showed is true mm. in a way of interpretation. What I think you are is true because now I have the chance to ask you questions about it and to make sure that what I saw, I think you are, is true. Because, you know, just because you saw a reel doesn't mean you maybe understood all the uh, like pieces and what exactly he did. Maybe it was not clear or whatever. And the second one, and the, uh, basically as important, I always say is, is, can I work with this person? Yeah. And then the, that's the question. So uh, like, isn't this, can I work with this person kind of a gut feeling? If you don't want this person around you, you know, you're like, oh, <laughs> that was, that was exhausting. That was uh, like, you know, you, you felt there was this kind of feeling of, of negativity or it's, it feels like you have to extract the information and it's kind of like exhausting for you to get anything out, which reflects a lot on like, you know, if you would be the lead and there's someone that has a problem and you're like, uh, can you tell me what exactly is the problem? Can you? So that's why I mean, is like, shouldn't it, isn't it like the gut feeling at the end of the day? And I don't say like the gut feeling in terms, I say it's professional gut feeling, you know, it's sure. not just, just, I hate this guy, you know, it's not my cup of tea kind of guy. Um, I'm, I'm more like professional gut feeling of there is something unnerving with this person. I don't, I cannot may sometimes point my finger in. And if everyone in the room agrees on the same feeling. I suppose. I mean, but when you get, when you mentioned, can I work with this guy? Um, th there's, would be for me, there'd be a list of criteria. What makes a person good to work with? You know, while they... They communicate. Uh, maybe they um, are on time, or they they meet their deadlines. Uh, all those sorts of things that you can sort of narrow down the type of questions that you're asking that would then equal I could work with this guy. But at the same time, it, it is a two way thing because the other way you know you would think is the candidate is evaluating. Can I work with this guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, I think, also the most relaxing interview for you. If the other person feels as an equal to you, mm. you know, it, does, it doesn't feel like, oh, give me the job and now I have to present myself. It reminds me, by the way, I just saw this post. A job application is basically two people lying to each other. That's basically what happens if if the two people are not honest or are don't feel like in a safe space or don't feel like they have the same like value in the room, you know, not kind of like I want this job and you give me this job and that's the only situation exists, but um, kind of you want you want a, a worker and I want this job. So it is kind of an equal situation. I think that creates a, a lot of times a more balanced outcome at the end of the day. And that's basically what we wanted to talk about is um, the recruitment experience. And I kind of like, like this phrase. So what would you define as the recruitment experience? The recruitment experience is, is about how the candidate feels about the process that they're, they're going through, right? So you kind of talked about it a little bit with um, you know, the interview itself. Are they, do they feel as an equal? Do they, do they, are they feeling sort of pressure to, to say things that, um, or make things up. Uh, we did have this one example um, the other day where the, the hiring managers were getting the sense that the, the individual was over-exaggerating on, on some of their accomplishments. 
Oh. And and I don't know if they if they felt that they needed to do it to try and make a, a big impression、um, because maybe they did feel unequal, but it. In the end, it, it kind of left a a weird feeling on the the hiring managers. As I told, gut feeling. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, true enough.、Uh, so, so really, you're right. It's you know, I want to make sure that、um, if we're we're engaging with someone, whether it's just through an application, whether it's you know we've interviewed them, or whether they've gone all the way to the、um, the, the the offer stage. That that candidate feels feels good about、um, the process that they've they've just been through, and and you know it, it may or may not end up hiring, or or maybe they end up taking another offer, but in the back of their mind, they they may feel you know what that was good, I enjoyed that experience, and I'd like to keep in touch with that person for future experiences. So, and that is probably also the the main goal is to have a positive. Connection to the company, exactly. And you know, this industry—it's—it's—it's it's, it's very cyclical, right? It's it's their contract base.、Um, their, you know, timing is is tends to be a huge thing,、uh, where you know someone's contract might not be coming up to an end. So when we need somebody, but you have that positive experience still, and somewhere down the road,、um, things line up and you get a chance to work together. So, what would be curious for me is like, why is that so important to you, personally? Like, why is that something? Because at the end of the day, it's not specifically your job. You like, you can just yes and no. You know, you can. It's it's kind of like the the bigger picture of this job. It's kind of this this investing in people that probably maybe or maybe a lot of them will never work for Animal Logic, for example, at the moment. And so it is kind of a. In in business sense, I would say, in a way, like waste of time or waste of money.、Um, but of course, we all understand that it is an investment in good relationship and stuff like that. What is your personal driving factor to have this much broader experience than just、uh, okay, we are interested in this person, so we woo this person into that, and the rest is like because you have to handle a lot of people. And it creates a lot of extra work to keep all this engagement. I mean,、uh, I literally talk to some people and and recommend them to keep、um, people connected. For example, on LinkedIn, you know, for example, we are sometimes writing to each other on LinkedIn throughout、mm -hmm. the years, and this is a lot of work. Even like for me as a, as a single person, it's a lot of work to keep connected to 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 certain people. But for you as an agency, basically. It sounds impossible and so much extra work. So, what what is the motivation behind that for you? I guess when you break it down to it, it's it's most basic sense is I care about people, right?、Um, and so so that's that's ultimately the driving force.、Um, but I, I think you know ultimately, I want people to see Animal Logic in the best sense possible. And so I represent Animal Logic, and so any of my interactions with people、um, represent the company. And so I feel that it's my responsibility to make sure that I'm doing the best I can the, for the company. Sadly enough, that most companies wouldn't agree. At least they try, but they fail、uh, miserably. What is the points that you feel you are emphasizing to make it reality? That's an interesting question.、Um, it, And, and I, I don't disagree with you. It's it's tough, right? And, and so, you know, whether it's just trying to be as responsive as possible to candidates. So one of the things that I I remember at、um, Animal Lo or at、uh, Image Engine,、um, this was before we had these these fancy applicant tracking systems that make life a lot easier. Is <laughs> I, I did want to make sure that everyone applied, everyone who applied, got a response. That no one ever felt they were applying to a black hole. So that that was one thing I've I've always tried. Now with applicant tracking systems, it's it's a lot nicer because we can set up templates that fit to people's needs, and and it's a lot easier to to get back to people a lot quicker with responses.、Um, 
But regardless, uh, I, I've always tried to make sure that I'm responsive to people, that I, I understand, you know, people are waiting for some sort of response. And, and I hear that. I, I definitely hear that from candidates. You know, I, I'm rejecting them and they seem just happy that somebody responded regardless. <laughs> I can imagine because that's actually, I think that's, I think the most frustrating experience actually in being a recruiter and being the recruited is kind of this, this void, you know, like where you're not sure what's going on, um, either complete void or just kind of like an automatic response, but basically, thank you. No, thank you. And that's, I think the, the hardest part about this is this, um, you always feel that people are mostly responsive when they want something from you. Um, I'm talking more from the company side now. So, mm. so like if they're kind of interested, then they kind of keep you in the loop. If they're basically not interested, then like you get basically zero from them. And it creates this, this hardcore frustration because sometimes you have a bad judgment of yourself. Sometimes you are not sure. Sometimes you don't know what's going on. And I think that's the hardest part for applying for jobs is this, I don't know why I'm not moving forward and and that's something that basically um only the the company that you're applying for can solve a little mostly because they can tell you why they didn't pick you i mean it doesn't have to be with like something regarding you but the problem with human minds is like we after a while if you get like 10 20 50 rejections we start to we are a failure no one wants us and then we start to have this someone uh, told me that it's like um, the biggest problem with being respons responsive is um, you cannot like respond to anyone, especially not in a, in a meaningful sense, because then you will you will basically have no time to to do your job. <laughs> because if you would if you basically would respond to any applicant with a with a little bit like a free sentence of why we didn't pick you and what he can do and you know like a little bit of just to to create a little bit of a response real response just besides we don't take pick you i think then then you will not have time compared to you know and, and that's that's i think the biggest problem i feel like in in your situation agreed i i would love to do more you know there's there's many times i get um candidates coming back and say hey can you give me some feedback and and I, unfortunately yeah, you know, I mean, I sometimes try and just give some generic feedback on just things I know the supervisors are looking for to, but it, it's not specific feedback to their, nece not necessarily to them. Um, so I do try and, and, and do the best, but you're right, there, there just isn't time. And that's unfortunate because uh, I think people, if they got specific feedback, it, it definitely could make a difference. I mean, that would make the, the difference of like, also what should I do in the future? You know, mm -hmm. should I push harder on that because I'm not good enough or should I continue because it's just not the reason because of me, because it was bad timing or uh, there's a lot of said, I would be curious. I, I'm not sure if you have something of a statistic on that point. Uh, do you have a little bit of a rule of thumb? How many people uh, are um, kind of declined for, specific reasons you know like for example how many uh from the applicants are declined because they're basically don't uh, align to the standards you know they are not here they're here and you you don't even have like they don't actually have a chance to be like coming to the interview do you have something like that because that would be a uh, curious if that's something you can share um i, I might have have to get back to you on that one because it, it really depends on on the role like uh the it's so different between like, for example, animators to effects artists or riggers. You, you just get such a, a wide difference of, of application numbers. And, and today's market is, is so different as well, where, where we're seeing a lot more sourcing versus applications just because there's so many opportunities. I, I feel people are waiting to be tapped on the shoulder versus uh, actually applying for jobs. Oh, so sourcing is just uh, waiting, like open for business. Come Sor to me. Sourcing is, is me reaching out to people 
and saying, mm. hey, are you interested in, in an opportunity? Yeah, this is actually funny that you mentioned that. I, I literally just wrote a, a, a newsletter about that because I saw someone has a title open for opportunities. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever saw. Because um, the thing is, I don't even know for what opportunities he's open because that was his title. So the only thing I see in the small window, if I see him like somewhere on LinkedIn, I see his name and open for opportunities. So I literally had to click on him, look at his experience to find even out for what opportunities he's open to. And and this is so kind of a waste of like like energy, you know, no one, no recruiter in the world will, if I don't know this name, but I see like something on the sidebar or something, I will not do the effort and go through his experience just to figure out. But if I see like, oh, technical director and I'm searching for one, maybe I click on that, you know? So it, it is this, this actually this thing where I say, where I actually mentioned in this new newsletter is like, um, you shouldn't be open for opportunities. You should strive to, to create opportunities, which means like you should have a LinkedIn account. You should apply for jobs. You should uh, tap uh, recruiters on the shoulder and say, hey guys, I'm, I have a new showreel. How about that? You should keep connected to recruiters, especially, or maybe maybe other people, you know, like, uh, general updates, ask them maybe questions. For example, that's one thing I do. I ask sometimes um, artists is like, how is it working there? Hmm. You know, is like, how how is that uh, being at Animal Logic in the lighting department, for example? Like, what is the, like the hours? Uh, how is the lead? Um, all this question, which actually at the end of the day matters more than... I don't know, like, uh, is it like 100 euros more a month or is that is there free coffee or something like that <laughs> in the office or free energy drinks? Being responsive. That is one, one, of, one of the points that you would um, put in the experience part. What else do you, do you feel uh, is important for creating this recruitment experience in itself to make it, to make it work for both sides? Yeah, and you know, I think the well, if we kind of even go back to the the beginning, um, the applicant, the application process, right? So, so that should should be as easy as possible for for individuals. Um, uh, I I remember when I I first started at Animal Logic, we we had this old applicant tracking system and. And the, the application process was so complex. I was like, <laughs> wow, it must be just frustrating for, for people who want to apply. Uh, <laughs> we need to make this easier for people. Uh, so so that, that's exactly one of the things that I was looking for in the new system is, is something that, that really helped. And, you know, I guess just if somebody wanted to apply and they were thinking about it and they clicked on the job, it would be simple just to, to get their details in there. And, and so that, that is part of the experience is, is, is that application process. And that was important to, to me um, in creating a good experience. Yeah, I remember. I, I'm not sure what, what kind of system exactly is uh, at Animal Logic, but I remember uh, applying for Pixar and they have this weird uh, adequated system at still, which is like absolutely horrible. And um, <laughs> one of the things... Uh, I absolutely hate it about it, and I, there are multiple companies who have this, is, is when you have to type in each experience manually <laughs> each time you apply for a job. And I remember I applied like for free positions, like free positions, and every time I have to like have my, my seven work experience, my free universities, <laughs> and um, with all the details, because you also want to pack a little bit of the project that you worked on and stuff like that. And I remember uh, after the third time, I kind of skipped half of it. I just like, like I don't care. Like uh, it, it is not like literally. It was strange. I mean, maybe it's it's weird, but it was like it's not worth my my time to to do it free time. I feel so dumb that like I don't even care to apply anymore. <laughs> kind of way, <laughs> because it is dumb, and I I saw that a lot of times, and it's like. I know it helps you guys because it makes everything more data-based and stuff like that instead of having like a resume or something like that. But this specific thing where I was just thinking, okay, I'm applying for Pixar. It is mainly engineers who are working there and they cannot get it right that it saves my information, that I can reuse it again and don't have to do it again. This is basically what you say with the recruitment experience. This destroys a little bit of the feeling I get to get inside. Because for me, it's like, if they don't care about the movie, if they don't care about the title, I, I have already a bad feeling about the movie. 
Um, you know, if they don't care about the website where I'm applying, I, I, I'm not sure if the the fanciness of the result is the same, you know, kind of. Uh, mm. It's a weird thing, but that's why I agree with your uh, assessment of how important it is to create this like banner in front of the building, basically, to to like express the same quality inside as outside. Mm -hmm. And now that, that doesn't mean we, we don't want effort from, from artists as well, right? So, you know, oftentimes we might get just a LinkedIn, a generic LinkedIn profile that's uploaded as a resume and it, it doesn't have a lot of detail on it. And, and of course, you know, we, we want people to put forth effort to show that they're interested in the job. But sure. Dealing with the software itself and, and applying, that's where I said it. It, it, needs, it needs to be seamless. It just needs to be encouraging. We now went through the stages. So we basically applied. We, we went through, um, we get in contact with you, maybe a back and forth. Maybe we get a little bit of feedback through time. So what is next in the experience uh, structure? The interview, of course, would be the big one uh, coming in for the interview. Um, well, I guess it's Zoom these days, right? So, <laughs> it not not my favorite. I, I I mean, there there are some positive aspects. I was just chatting with the the recruiter yesterday, as I mentioned, and and we were talking about sort of the pros and cons. And you know, I, I realize that uh, at least local people, um, if you're if you're hiring someone or, or interviewing someone, and they're working, it you know, if if they're coming in for an interview, they need to think about. Oh, I got travel time and I got to take this big chunk of time off work. You know, how does that work? Um, Zoom makes that so much easier, right? So they can just kind of pop up, uh, pop off in a, a quiet room or maybe step outside. And um, it really shrinks the, the amount of time they're taking off work. And I, I can appreciate that. But you definitely miss something about um, being in person that... that um, that I, I I'm looking forward to get getting back to uh, and and part of it is is just you know coming in and feeling the vibe of the the studio itself right you you step into the the studio you kind of look around and you get this like really cool energy and you're like yeah I can see myself working here versus on on Zoom you just you don't get that right it, it's it's well at least it's very hard. <laughs> Welcome to our short mid episode coffee break. If you love the content and would like to have a successful career in the film or games industry yourself, check out my website 21artistshow.com. There you can find helpful articles, masterclasses and coaching opportunities that help dozens of my students to bring their profession to the next level. That's all. Check out 21artistshow.com and share the podcast with cool people you know. Let's continue with the episode. No, but that's that's actually a little bit of a question I, I kind of I kind of have for you. Like, how does it how does it change, and how did you change the interview to kind of adjust to this change, basically? Um, I, I mean, the interview process is is still the same, right? We're we're still you know popping up and in, in well, we're still gathering together. The, the same people are involved, and it it can be a little bit more awkward because you know there's lags and and there's <laughs> and you're not sitting all together so you know someone might it's like do I ask you a question or does he have a question and so those things aren't as natural um, as as it would be if you're you're sitting in person but overall um, the experience is, is still pretty much the, the same now I, I also do like um, it uh, it makes it easier for like sharing a person's demo reel as well on using using zoom uh, where you just kind of share your screen and boom, you got the reel and the person can can talk about that reel. Um, it's harder to do that in, in person. Uh, so there, there are definitely pros and cons. But I, I think overall, just coming back to, to the experience is, you know, uh, one, that, that communication with the, the recruiter in setting up the interview, right? We want to make sure that the, the candidate feels ready and prepared. So we always talk about, you know, who's going to be in the interview so they know. And maybe they want to do a little bit of LinkedIn stalking first so that they can 
get a sense of i always say it's important to have a strong linkedin profile like this is like the the facebook where you st like before that it was facebook everyone was like okay what he's doing and then uh, looking at nowadays it's actually more linkedin i feel like maybe the candidates you know go on linkedin and they see who their their interviewers are going to be and they they kind of build that little bit of, of connection first um and then you know just making sure that they have all the the links that they need so, so there's there's a lot of that, that stuff that happens up front. And then with the interview itself, you know, I, I make sure that, you know, I give a, a nice introduction that allows the, the candidate time to settle in. Uh, kind of like what, what we did, you know, we don't want to just all of a sudden jump in with some questions and... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's about making them feel, feel comfortable. Um, and then... You know, ideally, is uh, is leaving some time for for them to ask questions because you know, kind of like we talked about, it's it's a two way. It's always a two way conversation, right? We want to make sure that they're comfortable and have the knowledge that they they need to to make decisions that the that that makes sense for them and where they're at. I would be curious because we talked we talked a little bit about being equal in in an interview. How do you see? both sides and their roles in the interview specifically like what is your because everyone has a specific responsibility you know you expect someone from the other side you know that he answers and gives you clarity for example maybe um that's the that's the thing and you have your responsibility for example i told told you like as a as a as a podcaster here my responsibility is to being a commentator i'm a someone who mm -hmm. who drives the episode and and gets this um thing going so and there, there's of course the content comes a lot from you for example in in a, in a sense so what what is in your sense when you sit down with someone maybe you are in a group um what is what is the roles that you kind of dis define for yourself and then you expect a little bit from the other side basically i guess one thing i don't expect from you know, and, and I would even say don't want from the candidate is to drive the uh, the flow of the interview. Uh, I've had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> they, they, <hi>. How <laughs> does it how does it look like? It's frustrating for for us on our side because we're not getting the the questions that we want to ask. It does show that maybe the person's engaged and they just are very curious. Um, uh, but I, so one of the, th the things I do is at the beginning of the interview, I always try to set the agenda. You know, it's like, okay, first uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction. Then you can introduce yourself. We'll ask some questions. Then we can talk about the, the role and answer any questions that you have. And I make sure that they understand. Does that sound good? They're like, yeah, that sounds great. And then we move forward. It gives the, 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 the candidate an understanding of the flow of the interview. So they, they know what to expect, right? Because um, I, I think that's probably the probably the biggest thing for, for a candidate stepping in an interview is what, what, sh what should I expect uh, as part of this conversation? In some instances, it could be perceived that that person is challenging to work with because, you know, the supervisor or the lead's going to go and try and talk to them and then they're just going to, go off and, and it, it's hard to manage them. And, and uh, so it just, you know, it always needs to be a balance of conversation where if I'm asking a person a question, they're not giving me the shortest answer possible. And they're not going off on this tangent for, for half the interview, but really they're just thinking about the compact question, making sure they're answering the question and providing the detail necessary. We align a lot of things. It's the same thing with 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 us, for example. Is like I, I I like ask questions or or push some topics, and then of course it would be bad if you say like, stop. <laughs> You know, and, and it would be also kind of uh, bad if you start to go like. Uh, uh, Neverlands, basically. So <laughs> it is. A, that's the same same thing. So I kind of kind of can can relate to to that situation. One of my favorite one of my favorite stories um, is uh, we had this one interview, and it was a uh, it was um via telephone. So back in the day, <laughs> uh, so we had <laughs> we had we had the call on speakerphone. And we, you know, we started off the interview and this person, they just went off and they just started talking and talking and talking. 
and something happened, and we lost the call. Uh, it, it dropped out on our end. And I'm also okay, like scrambling, trying to call them back. We called them back, we reconnected, and they were still talking as if nothing had happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, so unaware of like the surroundings, right? Of, of the interaction with, uh, with the individuals and just all about in your head, right? So. <laughs> yes, I we we had such a laugh at that one. It was it, I felt bad, <laughs> but uh, it was still funny. <laughs> so uh, how do you how do you dis distract uh, basically something as a negative element, like for example, you know, not being aware of your surroundings or, and just being nervous? I always try and, and consider people's situations, right? Um, you know, maybe you kind of talked about this idea of maybe they've been out for of work for a while and 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 they're a little bit frustrated and so coming into the interview it might be a little bit rusty or or not have the energy that that and you kind of you know you have to take those things into consideration um or you know there's been situations where somebody's worked at a company for a long time and you can probably You can tell that they haven't interviewed in a while, but uh, you take those into consideration and you th it's, it's coming down to, you know, is this person, you know, do they have the talent and are, th are they a good person? Do we need to talk to them again, right? Maybe, maybe we should set up a, a second interview and, and just get, uh, get a, a sense of maybe what, what we actually felt and is it, confirm that or... or Uh, could be the second time they, they come off a little bit different. Or even in some cases, I, I know we've addressed our concern with, with the individual and it's been clarified that way. It is so hard to, I mean, with experience, I, that's, that's the thing. You know, with experience, you get a feeling for what is fake, what is real a little bit, you know, like if, is that a personality type or is that nervousness, inexperience, and stuff like that. Because if it's a personality type, you get someone on your hands you don't want. If, if, if it's just a situational thing, you, you, you have to dig a little bit to figure out is that, like, how real is that? And, it, um, and that's also, like, one of the things that I feel like um, being more small talky um, helps a lot in this, in this sense. That's, for example, one of the things I always say is, like, Even if it's dumb and it's and it's like doesn't really mean anything per se in the beginning, is like always ask how are you doing in the beginning. Just ask it, <laughs> even if it's like good, you know, both sides. Oh, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. This very small thing already creates this tension release and creates yeah. a little bit of of a personality thing. And if you can push it a little bit more throughout the interview, like both sides. Uh, I feel like it creates this opening up and, and creates a little bit of trust because well, like small things of, of being human uh, all, always uh, break this ice of, okay, I'm, I'm here because I always uh, say uh, for some people, an interview is like congressional hearing, <laughs> you know, where like, like Mark Zuckerberg sits there and is like, oh, Facebook did something wrong. Please answer this question. And that, that sometimes for a lot of people, especially in the beginning, feels like you sit there, people ask you questions, you have to better answer them. And, and that's the worst thing, there's a difference between a, a right answer and a wrong answer. Yes. Yes. That, <laughs> that, that's the challenge, right? You, you are being judged on your, your answers. You know, I was just thinking the, the, one of the other things that comes up quite, quite frequently too, and especially in this international market, is um, language barriers, right? So that's another thing that I, I think we do take into consideration is people's ability to answer questions. Are they, are they really trying? Is it, is it just because of some language barrier? Do we still feel that uh, regardless of that, that they're still able to, to deliver great work and we can work with that? Then, then sure, why not? We don't want to hold somebody back just maybe they, yeah, they, because of certain limitations that they may have. Um, in other areas. So we, I, I do think we, we do a good job at looking at people's scenarios and, and trying to assess those as part of the, the full 
package. Actually happened to me. It doesn't doesn't happen of, often to me, but it actually happened to me on my uh, Weta interview where I was uh, we did because I'm I'm I was applying for a pipeline job, which is of course more programmish. Mm. Um, they 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 did like a little bit of a check with like specific thing. Do you know what 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 this is? Do you know what this? Is? Do you know what a decorator is and stuff like that? And uh, it ended up being a little bit like uh, you felt like a little bit in a high school, you know, like you have this kind of questions, you know, like and you have to just remember them. And and I remember that I had such like one or two questions. I, I wasn't sure if I just don't know it because I only hear it in German. Ah. you know and I was like and uh, and I'm like uh, and I I start to stutter and a little bit of uh, a good trick uh, I always say if you don't know know an answer specifically for a do you know it question um just ask I'm not sure can you explain it and sometimes the other person will kind of explain the question a little bit more so you can even with language barrier or understanding barrier maybe you just don't know the specific word that they're asking but you understand in context and the, the best part is they just explain it and then you can always say now i know mm, I, I like it, that. what it is and that's something i, I, like uh, that. I can i can uh, relate sometimes i didn't have it too often because to be honest i'm not sure like that would be interesting for me how often do you have uh, like very technical questions and i mean artistically and technical technically so skill questions basically how often do you in the interview is is focused on like literally like do you know what poly da 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 is? Do you know what uh, da 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 is? Of course, probably not from yourself. Probably there's a supervisor or lead in there. But uh, how often do you have that situations? Probably almost every every interview. Oftentimes it would be you know we've got the the real uh, playing in the background and we'll we'll sort of dig into that um, those technical questions on the on the real. But but yeah, they they're part of the process. It's. You know, it's not not huge. Maybe you know, there's there's some get to know you questions, some technical questions, um, some more work ethic type questions. What do you think about overtime and paid? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a question to me? <laughs> <laughs> that was a hypothetical situation. <laughs> No, that, that's that's really cool because that's I think again um, I think the biggest issue I think most people have it goes a little bit both sides but probably more for the people who are applying is they don't understand the process enough and if they don't understand the process if you don't understand something you you feel like in in the dark and the longer it gives you a negative effect the more you hate it you know you become kind of like I hate the recruiting process because it's so like unfair or. Mm. You you basically play lottery. Some people play lottery basically because they don't know why and why why it sometimes works and why it doesn't work. You know, a little bit like dating for a lot of people. You know, I I don't think there's any harm in in candidates, and I get candidates um, asking me these questions. You know, what's the next step in the process? Right, a candidate can ask that question, or when can I hear back from you? A candidate can ask that question too. Right, so. Um, there, there can be, you know, if, if they're just sitting passively trying to guess, it's, it's kind of on them too. So I, I, I definitely encourage candidates if they if they're interested in, in the process or they want to make sure that the communication is happening. But let's just let's let's ask. And so what do you think if, if a candidate will, will write you an email like four days after the interview and ask like, hey, um, what's going on? Is there any progress or something? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, honest, honestly, hired. instantly hired. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing is is when you you get back to a candidate and then they've already accepted a job, and you're you're like, what? We we just had a conversation, uh, interview a couple days ago, and you're no longer available. Why didn't you say anything? Yeah. Why didn't you tell me? Hey, I got an offer. Um, what do you guys still interested? So the lack of communication for me is what frustrates me. Is I, I want to hear from the candidates. But that is actually a, a big point. I can tell you, um, I had a lot of people telling me they are afraid of asking uh, what's going on. You know, kind of like after the interview, um, they were waiting like one week, two weeks, and they were afraid to write an email and ask, hey, uh, 
is it still like going where what's going because they were afraid to annoy people and i i can specifically point a little bit mostly at women because they have a, a little bit more of this kind of empathy and they want to like don't push their luck too much and um th this is actually something where i always say like if you are nice if you ask nicely you know if you're not like hey where's the, <laughs> <laughs> where's the contract um i feel like especially a recruiter wh whose job it is to communicate and to keep the communication flow and to keep the like person engaged best case you know mm -hmm. um they normally are not like oh now fuck this guy now after he 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 wrote me four days after the interview <laughs> nope this comes back to our topic, right? The candidate experience. If, if candidates find me intimidating or find my, <laughs> my uh, coordinator who's you know, scheduling the interview with them intimidating, then we failed, ultimately. Uh, I, I want candidates to feel comfortable reaching out to me. And, and you know, I, I think uh, I mentioned this in, in our last conversation where you know, I had been in contact with this, this one candidate and, you know, it didn't work out. And they were thinking about looking for a new role and they reached out to me. It, it wasn't me knocking on their shoulder. It was, a, it, they reached out, they felt comfortable coming directly to me and that made me feel good. I mean, that's important. And it's basically coming back to the beginning where you should be active and you should, especially recruiters, keep them in a little bit in, in the flow for companies you are interested in. You know, if you're interested in animal logic, it makes sense to to like friendly banter a little bit with the people and just kind of keep them updated and apply. For example, I remember in the beginning, I applied each year to the job. I think I applied three times or four times at animal logic in the last uh, five years or something like that each year a little bit. And um, yeah, and I also kept uh, contact with a lot of people with you, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that is uh, one of the reasons that we have this episode, actually, because uh, I really enjoyed the way you were, you were approachable. I told you that before you were the one of the reasons that my, my, my one of my videos blow up because you <laughs> commented and liked it. And suddenly all your connections suddenly liked and commented on that one. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I, I, I totally, totally agree on that one. And, but again, I think, and that's basically the same thing for leadership and any, any situation where you are reason, like where you manage other people, you cannot always put the burden on yourself because a lot of pizza time is, it's their own projection of their own problems. You know, like, um, you, just because someone is afraid to write you doesn't mean like you can be the nicest guy in the world. Doesn't really mean, <laughs> mean anything. If, if the one other person on the other side is super insecure and projects all their fears onto the recruiter or the company or whatever. Um, you cannot convince them otherwise with any kind mm. of kind of call me if you have a question kind of uh, situation, you know. So I think there is a like there's a limit. Let's say there's a limit of how much you can really bring everyone on this. I agree on this thing. It's the same same limit for learning. Same thing for learning is like there's a limit of how much I can literally bring people, for example, into the TD role or the Python uh, role, because some people are just, I'm not a Python person. I'm not a coding person. <laughs> I will never learn it. And I can try as much as I want, as long as they have this, you know, mm -hmm. they will never learn. But the moment I believe everyone can learn Python, everyone can become a technical director in some sense. But um, if you are allergic to code because you think you're an artist, I can teach my mom if I want to, but but she will she will be allergic too much to that. That's one of the reasons <laughs> she will not learn. But she will be able to learn it because everyone is, you know. If you're not under the default intelligent IQ, everyone can learn uh, like basic Python to to do things. And I think the same applies for for recruitment. You know, like the normal person you will get if you do a good job, but there are always people who will doesn't matter what you do, kind of be the outliers of that. Well, you know, maybe next time you look at my LinkedIn, you might just see TD uh, changed it. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna go learn some later, Python. Py py Python <laughs> courses and yeah, 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 I, I see that. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. So after the interview, then of course, the last stage is, of course, you either, uh, the, the person gets the offer or the, in most cases, probably not. No? Like the, the the percentage cannot be the same. Um, yeah. So so what is important for you for the aftermath, basically? When I first started at Animal Logic, 
um, we tried to do uh, phone calls for, for every offer that, that we made. And, and I liked that. I definitely liked that approach because, you know, you're talking to an individual and you're answering questions that they have. That sounds cool. But yeah, but I did, I did find over time, um, I started giving people the option. You know, would you like an email or with the details uh, or do you prefer we jump on a phone call? And I would say about 90% of people prefer the email. And maybe it's, it's just easier. I, I think, you know, people are busy these days. They... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Is, is, it, is, it about, is it about just receiving the offer or is it about contract negotiation? It's about receiving the offer details. Okay. So I, I basically, when we deliver an offer, there's key points to the offer that we're talking about. You know, your, your title, your level, uh, the salary, um, if it, there's relocation involved, we're going to talk about that. Some of the benefits, um, those sorts of things that, that I, would, um, I would talk about over the phone or in some cases just kind of put in a quick little summary email to send them. And then once we're in agreement, then I give it to HR. They would put the official contract together and send that over to the candidate. So it's kind of a two-step process. I, I just want to make sure that you know, before we send the official offer, we've had a chance to discuss. And, and yeah, I, I would say that most people prefer email. And um, there have been, you know, some cases where they get the email first and then they want to jump on a phone call and just kind of talk about a few things as well. Um, but email tends to be where most people are comfortable with. I think that's a little bit of uh, of this uh, being afraid and nowadays, especially like, I mean, people don't call anyone like it's just like I had so many situations where I just wanted to call someone. It's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm not picking up the phone. I only write. And it's like, it's much more complicated <laughs> in a lot of sense. I know. I know. Um, I, it's much easier for me to just jump on a quick call and, and, and talk it through <laughs> than I have to think about writing out a full email. But um, you know, either way, I am I'm doing my best just to to be available for for people to answer questions um, and concerns that they may have, uh, and then then yeah, well, even even once it's to the HR stage, um, HR is available to to go through questions for you know if there's immigration or relocation, or it gets a little bit more complicated than than then there engaging with the candidate more on those aspects than than i am i mean for me uh like i would be in the 10 percent mark for sure um i think i understand if especially if it's about negotiation of contract i absolutely understand if it's some people are like mm, i'm comfortable to talk about it you know it feels always easier to write like mm. i want more money you know <laughs> i want more holidays or something like that it always feels like you know but i i, I know because the, the problem is it goes both ways it's easier for the other side too so it is always the same thing. You can. Yeah. It's easier to be to be abstract and just say no. Uh, agreed. On uh, an email than than on a call when someone like when you have a personality behind that and maybe you can go that far, but you you know you play. Uh, it's a little bit of a game. You know you don't want to spend too much. You want to spend spend the right amount for the person. You know and how much you can spend. So, but the other person also has a little bit the same feeling. And uh, I I learned it. it I, I read some studies about that. That uh, it, if most people want to have the abstract situation, email for example, mm -hmm. but it goes both ways. So it is, is, is this the same hard ex situation because the other person has also the abstract situation and can, it's as it, easy to deny something because yeah, like there is no personality specifically in an email, like, you know, not as much at least. And so I always say like, for me, it is a, a, a situation of working with other people. So I feel like I, I, I would enjoy a call basically. It's like, same thing, like a call without video, <laughs> like, you know, an interview without video would be strange for me. <laughs> Nowadays, yes, definitely would be. Um, <clears throat> and I think the other aspect of it, I do, I do try and consider myself an advocate for the candidate throughout the whole process. So, you know, there was a situation where I had a, a modeler apply and, um, in his application, he sent me one model uh, in a, a Vimeo. And it was just one model, and that was it. And I was thinking, wow, if I give that to the supervisor, they're going to think that, well, that's not enough. It's just one model. <laughs> <laughs> they will laugh at it. Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> it 
So I, you know, I reached out to him. I said, hey, you know, do you have any more work I could show to the, the supervisor? And he, he sent me a bunch of extra stuff, which was great. And then when I put forward that stuff, the, the supervisor really liked it. There was a lot of variety that they, they saw. And, and so I, I am trying to, to always think about, you know, I need to do my best to, to sell this person to the, the supervisor. Um, I don't, you know, I don't always try to, I guess the, the being, rather than being the opposite is I'm the, I'm the gatekeeper and I'm going to just <laughs> shut people <laughs> off. Um, I am, just, and, and even, you know, going back to the, the offer stage, <clears throat> I do try and consider, you know, what people are, are asking for, if it's reasonable and, and, you know, everyone has different scenarios and different reasons that they, they um have they're asking for what they're asking for uh and so you know i'm i'm always happy to to bring it up to the the um the, the hiring manager or the the decision maker and to see if we can come to some sort of agreement um again i'm not i'm not the type that's uh, no i'm the gatekeeper <sighs> i'm not gonna accept that <laughs> So, so yeah, it's, yeah, totally. It, it's, it, again, it's just all coming back to that, um, relationship building, you know, creating a good experience for, for the candidate so that, you know, they feel that they can trust me as their, as their recruiter, I guess you could say. Um, and that I'm, you know, working for them to, to, to help them along this process. Yeah, and also like every time I had the situations where I had contact, for example, until the um, the interview and afterwards with the recruiter, you know, like five emails maybe or something like that, mm. it made a complete difference of how I approach the interview, how I feel about the company, how I feel about the whole process. Like even as like kind of even if I would be declined at the end of the day. Um, just this kind of small emails banter uh, between that. I remember I, I one thing I remember, it was the funniest thing ever. I had this with, I think with Framestore I had this. And every time I wrote, I, I was like saying like, oh, um, like enjoy your holidays. Because in Germany it was holidays. And, and it was so funny, it was three, time, three emails uh, basically after each other, like one month from, apart from each other. And it was always holidays in Germany, but never holidays in, in England. And it was always the, the thing is like, oh, enjoy the holidays. And, and she's like, oh, we don't have holidays here. <laughs> and it was like, uh. <laughs> I was like, oh, I hope hopefully I didn't fuck it up for the interview later. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> thank you. But we don't have holidays here in, in England. <laughs> We have, of course, the other side, the, the 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 bigger side, which will be declined. You know, um, the the more people apply, then you actually can hire at the end of the day. So you have to decline them. So there will be uh, probably a call, an email, or something like that. So I I remember I told you in the pre-call uh, um, that I absolutely hate them. Um, the 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 post uh, interview emails or the post uh, apl application emails, and I think they suck. Um, so I collected four of, of the emails I got, um, after I applied for, for a company and I, I, I would like to have your rating on one to five Amazon rating, uh, what you think about decline email. Okay. So I will not tell you, uh, first who it is. I will tell you later. Um, okay. So, okay. So, uh, Amazon review five stars. Fantastic. One star, this is horrible. Okay, four, four okay. things. Okay, dear Alexander, thank you for a recent application for the position of a film crowd TD at our office. Unfortunately, on this occasion, we will not be taking your application any further as other applicants more closely matched our requirements. Thank you for your time and interest in company and we wish you every success with your search for suitable employment. Kind regards. <laughs> That's in in a in a just text biased like literally like just a text based email. I I'm, I'm going to be a little bit biased uh, on this one because it that is a very <laughs> common generic one that Welcome uh, welcome to what I, I, what I, I will, meant. <laughs> I will even admit that that we use so I'm going to give it a 3. 3. Oh, that, that, that's very kind. Okay, that's very I would get a 2, <laughs> but okay, that that was that was frame store. Dear Alexander, next one. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to consider you for employment. 
We have received your background and qualification and unfortunately your application is not a fit for our current needs. We appreciate your interest in company and wish you success in your job search sincerely. Yeah, I didn't like that one. Um, I'm, I'm going to give that one a one. Thank you, ILM. <laughs> Next one. Hi, Alexander. Thank you very much for your application. We truly value your interest in our studio, smiley face. Right now, we don't really have a position that we could recommend for you, but perhaps we'll have a chance to talk to each other in the future. Remember that there are more vacancies to come here at company. Once again, thanks for your time and effort to put in your application and we wish you all the best in your future career path. Best regards, recruitment crew. I'm gonna give it a three. Mm -hmm. I, I I mean it was it was nice it was nice. I, I mean oh, okay a two a two then just <laughs> wait 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 uh, five is is best and one is worst yeah 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 okay. I okay. mean the, I know that my reasoning my reasoning is okay, right the the first one <clears throat> it it did kind of give a reason that there were other applicants that better fit and and, and to me that that was the the reason that the other ones don't really give a reason. The language out of all three of them, I, I think they were very polite, right? And, and um, <clears throat> but um, you are right. You are right, it's, it's nothing specific. <laughs> okay, this, this was uh, CG Project Red from The oh, Witcher. Okay. I would give it a four, I think. Actually, you, you like that one. I, I like that one uh, because because it, it it made me feel like something, you know, it made me feel positive about them. Just the words. I understand that what you said is actually true. But to be honest, like, what is the difference? Like in both situations, of, of course, they didn't take me because someone else either got the job or they canceled the job or something like that. So it, like even the small sentence mm. doesn't really matter. And that's what I like, to be honest. OK, OK, OK. Yeah, I. I see where you're coming from on there. It is um, the value. It is this it is feeling of we love you, but we you're just not the fit at the moment. It, at the moment, it's very important here. In that case, and, and I, I it, the, the wording on that email tends to read that you didn't apply to a specific job. I think it was a general a general application. Interest, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense in terms of the, the language that they and use. Else it would be weird if I would apply for a technical director job and they're like, we don't know, <laughs> we don't have a position for you. <laughs> it was like, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's true. You're right. Um, you do want to come out feeling like, um, you know, that you're valued despite there not being a particular role. And that's what I, I like. And that's what I told you. Yeah, of course, sweet words in, the, in some sense. But I mean, if you know CG Project Red as a company, I think also it comes a little bit over. You know, I think it swaps also in this email. Like, you know how they are. They are very famous for having a good relationship with their customers and stuff like that. Mm. So um, I think it also has something in the back of my mind a little bit. And it comes over in this email, I feel like, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would give that's it four. Nice. You still at two? No, 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 no. I'll, I, I would agree as a gen as a general interest application. Uh, with taking that in context, I wasn't sure what what it was because, because but I, f I think it was uh, more of a, I'm interested uh, here in general. Then, then yeah, it works. It works as a four for me. Okay, final one, dear Alexander. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to consider you for employment. We regret to inform you that after careful consideration, we will not be moving forward with your candidacy for this role. We will retain your application information and may consider you for future opportunities within your skill set as they come to light. We appreciate your interest in a role here at company and we wish you all the best in your job search. While this particular role wasn't the right fit in this time, we encourage you to remain proactive in your quest for the perfect job here at company. I like that one. I, I, I think I'd give that one a four as well. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I'm not sure. I think I like the tone from CG Project Red more. Uh, this is, by the way, Blizzard. Feels a little bit more winky face, kind of. You know, it feels more personal. This feels a little bit more abstract, you know, a little bit more. But I like this proactive comments and we will keep your information. I mean, <laughs> this could be some people like, what? Deleted, but uh, we will keep your information and we we like we will uh, there is this kind of like 
I mean, that's what everyone wants, you know, glimpse of hope. You know, that's yep. the that's yeah, what they yeah, do, yeah. I think, really, really good. I can send it to you later. Maybe you you want to copy paste yeah, it. That would, for, that would be great. For <laughs> <laughs> suddenly suddenly like every every animal logic email sounds like Blizzard in the future. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I honestly though, I'm I'm always looking at my my templates and thinking, how can I make them better? How can I better respond to my uh, to the candidates? I I you know, I, and I'm, I have to admit, you know, I, I, we're, we're talking about this, this whole candidate experience, but uh, I have to admit, I am not perfect. And, <laughs> and, and I, I don't always live up to the ideals that I have, uh, just because it's, it's not always possible, you know. Um, <laughs> I just get overwhelmed sometimes in the number of applications or number of roles that we need to fill, and, and it's just fall behind, there's not enough resources, all those sorts of things uh, sometimes get in the way. But it's definitely not my intention. And, and I, I always hope that those who have experiences with me or anyone who, who works at, at Animal Logic are always positive. I mean, it's also in a way not not all your responsibility. That's that would be unfair, uh, you know, like to say like, oh, every email that was not sent or sent or whatever is is uh, is Jimmy's fault, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like like write Jimmy the email and complain for him personally, <laughs> uh, something like that. Because the thing is, I applied for three positions in 2018 for Animal Logic, and I never got one respond uh, besides the automatic uh, thank you for application email i never got uh, three years later i still waiting for what happened with that application <laughs> so i was a little bit like uh, because i was looking in that situation of course i was, uh, I was because I, I wanted actually to bring an animal logic um email to that as a as a kind of a rating situation but i couldn't find one because i never got one so i don't even know how how it is to to, to get this email <laughs> all right i'm gonna look into that <laughs> I would like to wrap it up a little bit, this topic. I think um, what, what was interesting about that for me is to see the whole process as, as a big process and not just like snippets of things, you know, not separated elements, but as, a, as an experience, as you mentioned, it is a connected thing where you, where you start something and end something and it goes afterwards even, you know, just because you didn't get hired for something, um, the process, the experience continues. It's not just this, the end of the job or not job, uh, because maybe in three years later, you get another uh, chance and then maybe you get hired then. And the, whole pro and the whole process makes a difference of, do you want to apply again? Because the experience was good enough before and you're not feel like burned from this situation. I do remember this, this one experience I had where we were, we were looking to fill a role. I can't, I can't remember what craft it was, but we were going through this series of, of interviews and um, uh, this one particular candidate just, you know, wasn't, wasn't the fit that we needed at the time. And um, I, you know, I rejected him. Um, but I guess his experience with us was good enough that he actually recommended someone else for the job. Mm. And to me, that, that, that was just uh, a, such a great feeling that, you know, I could, I could give someone uh, the experience that they had, that they still felt confident in, in my, the relationship that they had with Animal Logic. I always say this is one of the things uh, that shows extreme professionalism. If someone asks you, do you want this job? And if you say no, I always ask, um, do you need some recommendations? Like every time someone asks me, hey, uh, we, we like I, I had like from Amazon uh, recently, Amazon Studios asking me, hey, do you want to work in Edinburgh? I was like, uh, no, I'm currently doing other things, consultations. If you need someone like that, sure. Um, and but if you need a pipeline TD, I can recommend you like four or five guys. And and this is so important because how like I, I enjoyed every time if someone wrote to me because this person was writing to me because one of my students recommended me and uh, you know it goes in all directions so I feel like the the best people in the world uh, that have like a good sense of duty also in a way to their job and their profession and to their like community. Uh, are absolutely able to, if they have someone in mind, to just like reach out and say like, hey, uh, I'm not the right person maybe, 
but I, I know, which is harder if you are not declining, but you are declined. I think this is definitely, <laughs> you will not, you will not, normally you will not reach out to the recruiter. Yeah, thank you that you declined me, but I have like uh, three other people maybe are interested in. It's a little bit harder for sure. I, I agree, which is why I was, <laughs> I was surprised. So guys, this is how, how you surprise Jimmy, by the way. So if you ever get declined by him, just recommend some, some people. And he's like, mm, <laughs> I remember this person forever. <laughs> Maybe not his job, but I remember his face. The best interviews are the ones where it feels like a conversation. Um, I did, I did have this one supervisor. He, you know, he had a um, a list of questions, and it was funny because the the way that he approached it was almost like a, a checklist. And so he'd ask his question, and then he'd kind of tick off the box. You know, I got my answer for that one, and then he'd move on to the next question. But you know, sometimes the next question wasn't the ideal question based off the first question and, and the answer. So, you know, some, some hiring managers or supervisors are just really good at it, just taking it through this, uh, this conversation where you're asking questions, but it doesn't feel like an interview. It just feels like a conversation. That's it with this week's episode of the 21 Artist Show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. This podcast is 100% ad-free. And to keep it that way, check out my website, 21artistshow.com. There you can find exclusive access to awesome masterclasses and coaching opportunities to work successfully in visual effects, animation, and games. Just go to 21artistshow.com. And don't forget to share it with people who would benefit from that content and tell them they're awesome. See you on the next episode. Next on the 21 Art Show. Ultimately, within a team, you want kind of these very hyper motivated people in there um, who, who push you further and they, they give you kind of a wake up call if you're already more experienced and it's like, yeah, actually look at this person is really happy, even though nothing, everything looks wrong maybe, but this, this inspiration, this motivation is very, very much helping myself as well to keep going, push further, to be better.